Welcome back. So this is going to be the first video for chapter four, which is all about equilibrium in the financial market. So in the last set of videos, we talked about equilibrium in the goods market, meaning that the amount that we demanded uh, in goods and services had to be equal to the amount that we produced in goods and services. And we were able to come up with the multiplier model, a simplified version of one, which we will extend uh, in later chapters. In this chapter, we're looking at money demand. And the idea is really how much do, how much money do people want to hold as opposed to interest bearing accounts? And the idea here is that there's a trade off between the liquidity that money provides, the ability to buy things, um, and the interest rate that you could get if you had, for instance, uh, bonds instead of money. So the most important thing to keep in mind is that in this model, the interest rate is what acts as a price in order to bring uh, money supply and money demand equal. But at the same time, the Federal Reserve, uh, the central bank of the United States or the central bank in other areas is really what is uh, setting that interest rate. And so they are able to choose the point along the money demand curve uh, where they want to be. So some people can find financial markets a little bit intimidating. Uh, they can be fairly complex. Um, when we think about things like the, the stock market, the bond market, all of the commodity markets and derivative markets, um, they can be pretty complicated. Uh, we're going to focus on a very simple part of the financial market, specifically money demand and money supply and the role of the central bank. And of course, the central bank in the United States, as we said, is the Federal Reserve Bank or just the Fed. Um, but there are other central banks around the world, the European Central Bank, the Central Bank of Japan, uh, etc. So our main choice in this model is going to be choosing between whether we want to hold our financial assets between money and bonds. Now, obviously, in the real world, there are lots of choices, right? There are different types of money. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, there's currency, there's checking accounts, there's savings accounts, and each are more or less liquid um, and will therefore pay a lower or higher interest rate, right? Having cash doesn't pay any interest rate at all. Checking accounts usually pay a very, very low interest rate. Savings accounts will pay a slightly higher interest rate. Uh, money market accounts might pay an even slightly higher interest rate. But if you want to have even higher interest rates, then you have to buy bonds. And bonds are just loans, right? We'll talk mostly about uh, treasury bills and treasury bonds, which are loans to the federal government. There are also, of course, corporate bonds that are loans to corporations, municipal bonds, which are loans to state and local governments. Um, but all of them pay interest and all of them are not very liquid, right? You can't use them to buy uh, things. So the two types of money that we'll focus on that we include in what's called M1 are currency and checkable deposits, just checking accounts. Um, and bonds, we'll assume that currency and checkable deposits don't pay any interest. And bonds will pay some positive interest rate I, uh, which will be the nominal interest rate. And we will complicate the picture a little bit in later chapters when we think about uh, the real interest rate versus the nominal interest rate. So then how much money do people want to hold? Well, one is you need to have more money if you're going to buy more stuff, right? So you, if you're going grocery shopping, you need to have money. If you're going to get, you know, buy gas, you need to have money. Now, this obviously can be complicated a little bit with the use of uh, credit cards. But even when you use a credit card, there still needs to be money in the system to be paid, right? Because uh, you're using your credit card, but then your bank that issued the credit card is paying for the transaction with money, and then you're going to pay the bank back with money at the end of the month. Um, so if you are buying more stuff, you need more money. And then if the interest rate is higher, then that means that the opportunity cost of holding money is higher, so you want to hold less money, right? Now, interest rates right now are really, really low. Uh, I don't even know if I get any interest on my checking account. And on my savings account, it's probably like 0.25% or something. So the opportunity cost of having money is, is very, very low. Um, and so there's really no big reason to hold um, bonds. 
But, you know, back in the early 80s, the interest rates on bonds were pretty high. They were, you know, 10, 12, 15, uh, even 20%. Um, and so there you wanted to be a lot more careful about which money you left in your checking account uh, or held as currency and which money you put in a money market account or even, you know, a certificate of deposit or something that was less liquid, but that would pay a higher interest rate. So this is our trade-off, right? This is our money. Now we need to be a little bit careful about how we use terms because we use the term money for a lot of things, right? We use it for cash, we use it for checking accounts. We say, oh, he has a lot of money, meaning he has a lot of wealth. Um, but money, the way we use it, is what you can use to pay for transactions. That means it's liquid. And so it's gonna be either checking accounts or cash. Income is what you earn, right? It's a flow variable. It's important to understand the difference between a flow variable, which is measured over a period of time, whether that's a week, a month, or a year, and a stock variable, which is measured at a specific point in time. Um, wealth, for instance, would be a stock variable. And saving then is, or your savings is part of your wealth. And so usually for wealth, most people have, you know, maybe some housing wealth, uh, maybe some financial wealth in a retirement account. Um, and you obviously build your wealth through saving, right? In the last chapter, we talked about, you know, the propensity to consume C1. Um, and the flip side of that one minus C1 is the propensity to save. Um, and finally, investment, we, so investment in, in regular day parlance is uh, often financial investment, but in economics, when we talk about investment, we're usually talking about buying new capital goods. So we use that term investment on the goods side rather than the financial side uh, of the market. Um, Whereas financial investments um, are buying, you know, stock shares, bonds, etc. Um, so we want to keep those separate. All right, so let's think about the demand for money. So money demand, which we'll call MD, uh, is going to be equal to nominal income, right? What we call dollar sign Y. Uh, and that, the idea there is that that helps measure the level of transaction in the economy. Uh, a $5 trillion economy is going to have a different money demand than a $10 trillion economy or a $20 trillion economy. Um, and then there's going to be some function of the interest rate I, L. We'll call it L for the liquidity function. And this negative sign here in Formula 4.1 means that money demand will go down as the interest rate goes up. Um, but we're not putting a... Uh, form yet on our uh, liquidity function. So we just know a higher interest rate leads to lower money demand and a lower interest rate leads to higher money demand. All right, so we've got this downward sloping demand for money. We're going to put, as we do with you know, supply and demand graphs, we're going to put the price, which in this case is the interest rate on the vertical axis, and we're going to put the quantity, in this case the quantity of money, on the horizontal axis. And we'll get this downward sloping money demand curve. And so here we have our downward sloping money demand curve. And we can see that if nominal income increases, we're going to get a shift to the right in money demand. If nominal income decreased, uh, we would get a shift to the left uh, of our money demand. Right? For any given interest rate, um, a higher nominal income, higher nominal GDP will mean we have a demand for more money and a lower nominal GDP will mean we have a demand for less money. So if we look in the United States, these are numbers for 2006, which was kind of a normal year, at least in terms of money demand. Years since 2006 have not really been normal and it's not clear if we're going to go back to the way we were. But in 2006, we had about $750 billion of currency in circulation. Uh, households held about 170, firms uh, held about 80 billion, um, but foreigners abroad held about 500 billion. Um, and this was a way both for, you know, countries that had an unstable currency um, to keep, you know, hold their wealth, use it as a store of value. Um, and also, unfortunately, you know, sort of a lot of um, people in powerful positions that were uh, you know, doing things that they shouldn't be doing, um, they would also hold a lot of their assets in U.S. currency um, as a way, you know, to sort of protect themselves and, and have it, you know, as liquid as possible. 
Um, you can't freeze cash the way you can freeze a, a bank account. Um, money has really increased since the financial crisis in 2008. And we'll look at some graphs a little bit later. Um, but currency in circulation is over $2 trillion. M1, which is currency and checking accounts, has shot up. M2 has shot up, although uh, not by quite as much. Um, so there's a lot of money in the economy. And this actually made a lot of people nervous about inflation. But as we've seen, inflation has been fairly low. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind when thinking about money supply and inflation is that yes you need a more money supply in order to get inflation but you also need more demand um, firms can only increase prices if you know demand is high um, and that has not been the case all right so let's think about how do we actually determine the interest rate we have a money demand we also need a money supply well the central bank at least mostly controls the money supply and so we'll think about this more in more detail in uh both this chapter and later chapters. Um, but for now, we're going to assume that the central bank can sort of fix the, the money supply. Um, so we have this sort of money supply is just equal to whatever amount of money the central bank wants. And so if that's true, then we have money supply equal to money demand. We just have some number chosen by the central bank is equal to our money demand, uh, downward sloping curve. And we get a vertical money supply curve and a downward sloping money demand curve. And our equilibrium is at A. The money supply and money demand equilibrium is just M chosen by the central bank. Um, and the interest rate is I. Now it's important to see that as long as the central bank controls the money supply, as long as that money supply is vertical, they're just choosing a point along the money demand curve, right? They're choosing both an interest rate and a money supply at the same time. Similar kind of to what a monopolist does in a, in a goods market, right? They face a downward sloping demand curve and they choose the uh, price and quantity that maximizes profit. Here, the central bank is choosing the interest rate and money supply that they believe will maximize economic conditions for the entire economy. So if we have an increase in demand for money, and the central bank does not change the money supply, then we will get an increase in the interest rate. Notice that when we get an increase in the demand for money, if the central bank doesn't do anything, we don't actually get an increase in the quantity of money, right? That's fixed by the central bank. Um, so in this case, the interest rate would increase from I to I prime uh, when there's an increase in uh, nominal GDP. This is gonna be really important because we're going to see that interest rates are going to be one of the, the prices that brings us back to equilibrium uh, in the medium run. In the short run, the central bank can sort of decide whether or not they want to allow interest rates to increase or whether they want to you know, increase the money supply and therefore decrease uh, the interest rates back to where they were. Um, and so, you know, we can see like, okay, well, if we have a higher interest rate like we had in the last graph and we wanted to get back to a lower interest rate, then we need to increase the money supply. The Federal Reserve can do this. We'll talk about uh, how they do that in a little more detail uh, in, in a little bit. Um, but basically what they're doing is they're increasing the money supply by buying uh, treasury bills and treasury bonds. Um, from banks and giving them money in exchange, although technically it's reserves, as we'll see. So finally, you know, it's important to really remember that the interest rate is a price, right? The interest rate is what brings money demand and money supply into equilibrium, given that the money supply is fixed by the central bank. Um, and that interest rate, if that interest rate is uh, not able to move or if it's stuck at zero um, then we can get some issues that mean that monetary policy is not going to be as successful um, as it otherwise would be.